I recently finished watching the Netflix show Mindhunter. It's set in the 1970s and the main character is Holden Ford, a young FBI agent who isn't happy with the established way of doing things. In the dark, huh? We are. I have studied everything we have to offer. I've taken this ride out here with you, listened to everything that you've been kind enough to teach me, but I still think we are talking about something that we don't understand in the slightest. I was trying Holden is frustrated because he feels the FBI's thinking about crime is out of date. As a result, he decides to take the unusual step of going into prisons to interview serial killers like Ed Kemper to find out how they think. In this modern society, what do we do with the Ed Kempers of the world? What is the night your department? From your perspective. Death by torture? These interviews are the best moments of Mindhunter, and they're all driven by Holden's desire to understand crime. Because when he complains... But I still think we are talking about something that we don't understand in the slightest. Killers like Ed Kemper are what he's talking about. What are the root causes of his actions? What causes crime? This is an important question, and in this film I want to explore a radically different way of answering it. It's a way of thinking about crime that, in the few places where it's been adopted, is having powerful results. It's also a way of thinking that's been ignored by the media and by politicians on both the left and right, mainly because its implications for how we see ourselves are profoundly disturbing. At the beginning of the series, Holden's desire to understand crime takes him to a university, where one of the professors poses a question. Are criminals born? Or are they formed? It's an interesting question, and often dramas can be put into one of two categories based on how they answer it. Sometimes a villain is born bad, evil because of some trait that's just presented as innate. Maybe they're a psychopath, programmed to be bad, a monster, or just British. At other times, criminals are presented as having been made that way by the world they've grown up in. Many of these kids are profoundly damaged. What they've seen, how they've lived. In other words, they're not born, but formed. You can see these approaches reflected in politics, with the right often arguing criminals are born bad. People riot to enjoy themselves. They don't riot because they have grievance. They don't riot because they've had unhappy childhoods. They riot because they are wicked, selfish, lawless, and absolutely unable to recognize authority or the difference between right and wrong. And the left understanding bad people was made that way by society. Is he, is he a criminal or a victim? Issues with his home life, he perhaps might not be getting the best education, he might have mental health problems. The debate between these views is long-standing, and it's one the writers of Mindhunter have put at the heart of their story. Monster, right? Take the scene where Holden is discussing the case of killer Charles Manson with local police. Here we have a child who was unwanted, unloved, regularly beaten, and repeatedly institutionalized. Now, might this not have had some sort of an effect on him? He was born that way. What way? Just bad. Can we be a little bit more specific? Technically, he didn't kill anybody. <laughs> Look at those eyes. How can you not say that dude's evil? The local police clearly believe that bad people are born that way. But what Holden and his colleagues are finding out in their interviews is that people can be made that way. For example, by an abusive mother. Why do you think she thought this? Because she was fucking nuts. You didn't do anything to frighten her? She frightened me. She'd make me sleep on a dirty old mattress in the basement, lock the door, 10 years old. Through their interviews, the detectives go from believing people are simply born bad to seeing how they might be formed that way by society. They go on to realize that if they can work out these root causes, they can work out the motivation of criminals and thus catch and stop them. It's this focus on motivation that makes them mind hunters, inventing criminal profiling and becoming the first criminal psychologists. This interest in the motivation of the offender dominates how we think about crime. From the endless dramas about killers whose crimes can only be stopped if detectives can work out their motivation, to the discussions you see on the news, where if you ever hear an explanation for crime, no discipline at home. Exposure to domestic violence. Absenteeism from school. Mass unemployment. Poverty. The focus is similarly always on the offender and their motivation. In fact, this is the fundamental thing that unites the various sides of the debate on crime. All sides agree that crime is caused by bad people and that to stop it, we need to look into the past 
to find the root causes of what motivated these people to go bad. But there is a little known but powerful alternative to the bad people model. And the best way to explain it is to tell you a story about motorbikes. It takes place in West Germany during the 1970s. At that time, motorcycling was popular. But unfortunately, there was a problem. Motorcycle thieves. <laughs> Each year, thieves stole more and more motorcycles. Until suddenly, in 1980, something mysterious happened. The numbers started to fall. Not just by a little, but by a lot. This was strange, especially if you were seeking a root cause to explain it. For the supporters of the idea that criminals are born, it's hard to believe that this drop was caused by a sudden change in human nature. And those who believe that criminals are formed couldn't point to big changes in employment, welfare or education at that time. The answer to this riddle? Motorcycle helmets. In 1980, a new law in West Germany made it compulsory to wear a helmet, which although put in place for safety reasons, also cut crime. Before the law, a thief riding away a stolen bike was inconspicuous, but now that person would attract the attention of police for not wearing a helmet. If you've just stolen a bike, getting stopped by the police is not what you want, and this risk was enough to lead to the big fall in thefts. Now why this happened might seem confusing. Why didn't thieves just take a helmet with them? But it turned out the thefts had been largely opportunistic and unplanned, and a small change was enough to prevent them from happening. This is not a story well explained by the bad people model of crime, with its focus on the offender and their motivation. In this example, a better explanation came not from the past, but from the present, the situation around the offender at the time of the crime. There is a branch of criminology that is based on this insight, called situational crime prevention. This approach supports anti-crime measures you encounter every day, the lock on your door, CCTV, car immobilizers, anything that makes committing a crime harder or less tempting. But what's radical about this way of thinking is it basically puts to one side the whole debate around root causes and motivation. While fixing issues like poverty or education are important, it argues we don't have to wait for those long-term changes to actually reduce crime. By focusing on the situation, we can start making an impact on crime right now. For example, the Welsh city of Cardiff had a problem with people getting glassed in drunken fights by making venues use plastic or shatterproof glass instead. Serious violence fell by 42%. A problem with bus robberies in the late 60s in New York was largely eliminated by introducing an exact fare system, which meant the bus drivers no longer had access to any change, which meant there was no point in robbing them. And look what happened to the number of car thefts when the government pressured the industry to install immobilizers. There are many more case studies than these, but despite the evidence for its effectiveness, situational crime prevention is largely ignored by policymakers and the media. And this is where we come back to Mindhunter. Serial killing is a crime that seems to be all about bad people. It doesn't feel like bike helmet laws, CCTV, or other changes in the situation would stop it. Yet most crime is not committed by such extreme people, and that's true even for the most serious crimes. For example, while our screens are full of serial killers preying on women they don't know, the latest UK numbers recorded strangers as suspects in only 13% of female homicides, with most of the women killed by partners or someone else they knew. And a recent study on sexual assault found that 90% of victims already knew their attacker. The standard way of thinking about crime is that it's all down to a few bad people, very different and distant to us. Whereas the reality is that crime is more every day, closer to home than we like to think. I think this is why we don't like situational explanations of crime. They suggest that given the right circumstances, the right temptation, the right situation, the criminal could be any of us, and that's uncomfortable. TV dramas like this might be made to scare us, but the world they portray is strangely more comforting to us than the reality. Hi, I'm Brendan. Thanks for watching. Uh, a bit dark, but I hope you found it interesting. If you did, please check out the other videos on the channel and sign up for my mailing list. It's the best way to hear about new projects.